Good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, before we get started, I do just want to tell you thank you uh, for being here. I know you've been away from your families a long time, traveled a long way. You've been really patient with us, and it's obvious that you've all been attentive uh, throughout the trial, and I know everyone here appreciates that. So I just wanted to, uh, to say thank you before we get going. Um, but we are here today to talk about Joe Clyde Daniels. Uh, Joe Clyde, he loved his flannel shirts, he loved his cowboy boots, and he loved to eat apples. You heard from Miss Donnerstag, Joe Clyde was full of life. He loved to have fun, and he liked to go to school and to learn. He had some physical and mental limitations. Um, he was developmentally delayed, uh, especially when compared to his peers. You heard that he couldn't speak very well. Full sentences were not something that he'd learned to do yet. He scored in the first percentile of gross motor skills, but he was making progress in his time at school. Mrs. Donnerstag and other teachers at Centennial were working hard with him, and he was making good progress. But then all that came to an end on a dark, cold, stormy night in April of 2018. And to tell you a little bit more about that, I want to refer you to the testimony that you heard of young Alex Nolan. Alex testified <clears throat> that him and Joe Clyde got home from school on April the 3rd, a little after 3 o'clock. You saw the bus video. You saw them getting off the school bus. Aunt Joyce met them at the end of the driveway, and they walked up to the house, and it was a normal day. It was a normal afternoon. Nothing was out of the ordinary. They ate supper, and eventually they went to bed. You heard testimony that Joe Clyde and Alex slept in the master bedroom. Right here. This is the living room, dining room, kitchen, and the other bedrooms. So the testimony was that Alex and Joe Clyde watched TV and they fell asleep in the master bedroom. Alex was awakened when Joe Clyde had peed in the floor. He walked to the other end of the house, told the defendant and Crystal Daniels what had happened, and they told him to go back to bed. So Alex went back to bed and went back to sleep. And you heard from his testimony, the next thing that he knew, he was awakened by a loud thump. He said, I let things cool down for a few seconds before he went out to see what was going on. And the, as we've spoken, the master bedroom is right next to the living room. He looks out the doors into the living room, and what he saw would change the course of his life and many others forever. He saw the defendant, Joseph Daniels, standing over the lifeless body of Joe Clyde. He saw Aunt Joyce and Noah in the kitchen and Crystal hiding at the other end of the house, just peeking around the corner. Later, a few minutes later, a few seconds later, he saw the defendant pick up the body and carry it outside. They went out the back door of the house, and Alex said he followed him a little later. After a few seconds, he went out to see what was going on. He said that the defendant laid the body of Joe Clyde in the front yard and then was walking all around the backyard. The defendant threatened Alex. If you don't help me, I'm going to beat you. So Alex opened the trunk and suggested putting the body in there. The defendant decided not to do that. He picked up the body and walked down the driveway. We can't tell you why he decided to carry the body down the driveway. We don't know. We know he did. Alex said he did. We also know that Jeannie Jones saw him down the road about eight-tenths of a mile. 
She never wavered from saying, it was him. She said, he wasn't looking directly at me, but I saw him. Daniel McCormick saw somebody down there at the end of the driveway. We can't tell you if he saw the defendant, if he saw Joe Clyde, or if he saw Alex. We know that all three of them were out there that night. We know the defendant was hiding the body. We know Joe Clyde was out running for his life. And we know that Alex walked to the end of the driveway trying to see where the defendant was carrying his little brother's body. After that, after Alex watched the defendant carry the body south on Garners Creek, he went back to the house. And he said, I tried to go to sleep as his young mind was trying to process what he'd seen. He said it was hard, but eventually... I did. I was able to go back to sleep. You saw Alex testify. He was eight years old when this happened. And he said, I didn't tell the truth in the beginning because I was trying to protect him. But that was a lie. He said, I'm here to tell you the truth now. I'm here to tell you what happened. And here's what the defendant says about Alex. Alex, yeah. He's a good boy. He's a liar. He tells the truth. I don't want to grab him. We talk, we talk, not to, you know, not to, to lie to anybody, you know, tell the truth. And, The defendant says, Alex is a good boy. He doesn't lie. I know they interviewed him. I'm pretty sure he told him everything. Alex came in here this week and he told y'all everything. In the face of his stepdad, in the face of his grandparents, being questioned by lawyers, he came in and he told you what happened. Now he said that he watched Joseph Daniels carry the body down the road. And there's been a lot of things said about the body and about where the body is. And if you recall, a couple, almost two weeks ago at the convention center, I told you at the end of the trial, you're not going to know. We can't tell you. The law doesn't require us to tell you. He says, I laid him in a field. Other times he says, I buried him. Other times he says, I threw him in the river. Other times he says, I put him in a pond. We can't tell you where the body is. We don't know if he buried him. He put him in the river. He put him in the pond. He put him in a dumpster somewhere like Love's Truck Stop or some other place. But what we do know is what Alex saw. We know what the defendant confessed to. We know what Jeannie Jones saw. So the night of April the 3rd, 2018, Alex goes back to sleep. And then he's awakened by the defendant the next morning, the morning of April the 4th, and the defendant's lie begins. The defendant concocts this story well, Joe Clyde, he must have just wanted to escape in the middle of the night. And think about that word, escape. Someone's child escaping from your house, from their own home. Escape. It's an interesting choice of words. But he must have escaped. He must have pushed the coffee table from the living room over to the door. He must have climbed up on the coffee table. You heard Miss Donnerstag say he probably couldn't have done that. He struggled making big steps like that and climbing like that. You heard Alex say, I've never seen him climb on the coffee table. But he must have pushed the coffee table over. He must have climbed up. He must have found the key, and he must have got the key in the lock, and he must have unlocked the lock. 
You heard the testimony. He struggled to unlock that toy plastic lock with the great big key that we brought in here and showed you. But this lock that's up near the door, up near the top of the door, over his head, he must have somehow got unlocked. He got the lock out of the latch. He put the key back on the mantle, because, of course, kids put keys back where they go and stuff back where they go. He threw the lock down in the toys, and then he pushed the coffee table back where it goes. And he did all this without making any noise. Now, Ms. Donnerstag and even the defendant have all said, Joe Clyde was not quiet. When Joe Clyde was doing something, you knew it because he made noise. But this night, he must have done all this without making any sound. He didn't slam the door when he escaped because the defendant testified, we can hear the door shut. But he must have escaped. Despite all odds, all these things that no one's ever seen him do before, he learned how to do all those things in the middle of the night and escaped. And based on that statement, one of the largest searches for a person in Middle Tennessee ensued. You've heard that there were hundreds and hundreds of citizen volunteers. There was over 20 law enforcement and emergency responder agencies that came and helped look. There was helicopters flying grid patterns. The TBI's airplane with its infrared camera was searching. You could see deer walking. You could see cows laying in the field. Ponds were drained. Sonar was run through ponds. The area was combed. No Joe Clyde. And we've heard testimony about the large search area. And right here is the area of Harris Road. We know that the defendant's house is up off of the map. And he's down here. The search extends down into Hickman County. You can see right here, it says Dixon County. Right here is Hickman County, and that's the county line. The defendant's house is up north in Dixon County. The search extended all the way out into Hickman County. From 112 Garners Creek in Dixon County, about six miles, I believe was the testimony of the search, and it extended down into Hickman County. There's a picture of the latch, the lock, the key, all that Joe Clyde, according to the defendant, learned how to operate in the middle of the night so that he could escape. The TBI, once suspicions started getting raised, questions started getting asked, there was a search of the house done on April the 7th. This is the exhibit from Greg Fort. He says, the VCR team responded to 1112 Garners Creek Road in Dixon, Tennessee, Dixon County, and they conducted a search. One of the things that was noted, as you'll note, there wasn't a whole lot found. You heard testimony from Agent Fort, though. He said it looked like the house had been cleaned. It had been vacuumed. It had been picked up. There was a possible bleach stain. He said, we can't tell you for sure whether or not it was bleach. In front of the coffee table in the living room. And the search goes on. But on April the 6th of 2018, the truth begins to come out. Agent Joey Boyd interviews the defendant and he begins to come out with the truth of what happened. He beat his son. He threw him on the coffee table. He killed him. He disposed of the body. Detective Trevor Daniel takes the defendant out to McElhaney Road. He makes several comments on the way out there. I want the donations to go to his funeral expenses. Why did I kill my son? Alex was a good boy. He doesn't lie. And many more statements. He gives a written statement later on that night. <coughs> I lied about where I told you the body was, 
But I killed my son. I disposed of the body. The next day, April the 7th, the defendant requests TBI to come talk to him. So they do. He says, I killed my son. He's consistent with that truth. But I think I threw his body in the river. So they drive down to the Piney River and multiple rivers. The Piney River specifically, the defendant says, I think it was here. I believe it was seven or, eight, or seven or eight out of ten sure that he threw him in the Piney River. The defendant's driven back up where he talks to his dad. This is not a police questioning. This is the defendant speaking with his father, and what does he tell his father? I killed Joe. Ladies and gentlemen, he is consistent that he killed Joe Clyde. The place where he put the body changes. He didn't tell where he put the body. But think back through the witnesses. Has there been one single witness who testified that this was a false confession? Has there been one single exhibit saying this was a false confession? There's been inferences made by attorneys, but think back through the proof in your mind. And then think back through the statements that were made because they were all consistent in he killed his son. I want to get into a little bit now of what we have to prove. This is some of the jury instructions that the judge is going to read to you. Premeditated murder. The defendant unlawfully and intentionally killed the victim, Joe Clyde Daniels. We know he did that. We've gone through that evidence and that testimony. He did it with premeditation. We haven't talked about that yet. Let's talk a little bit about premeditation. What is that? Premeditation is a act is done after the exercise of reflection and judgment. Premeditation means that the intent to kill must have been formed prior to the act itself. It is not necessary that the purpose to kill pre-exist in the mind of the accused for any definite period of time. He had to form the intent to kill Joe Clyde Daniels before he actually killed Joe Clyde Daniels. So the question for the jury, for y'all, is did he do that? And I want to take you back through some of the other proof. And this is hard to see, but it's been made in an exhibit, and it'll, it'll go back with you. The defendant lost his job, uh, quit, and the resignation was accepted and made it effective immediately on February the 28th. And that began what was a downward spiral for Mr. Daniels. You sat and listened to some very explicit messages, which we're not going to go back and rehash, but you heard them, you know what they said, between the defendant's wife and Crystal Daniels. Or excuse me, the defendant's wife, Crystal Daniels, and a Thomas Richards. Now we submit that the evidence would show Mr. Daniels found those messages. And here's why. Again on the screen, it's a little difficult to see, but it'll go back with you. You remember the last of the explicit messages ended March 28th. And on the screen there, it's Thomas Richards says, K.K. Knight. Then on 329, he messages Crystal Daniels and says, Hi. No response. 330, what's up? No response. Then again on 41, yo, no response. The defendant, after reading those messages, knew or at least he thought, based on his reading of those messages, that his wife was going to leave him. She wanted another man. She'd started an online relationship with this man. But importantly, he knew she needed Joe Clyde to be able to do that. Do you remember the message she sent to Mr. Richards? I get $1,200 a month for Joe Clyde. With that and a job, do you think I can make it? That planted the seed in the defendant's mind. 
my wife can't leave me without Joe Clyde because she needs the $1,200 a month she gets for his disability to be able to make it. And then on March the 30th, remember the responses were on the 29th, 30th, and April 1st, the hi, yo, what's up? In the middle of that, on March the 30th, on the defendant's phone, he began searching anonymous paternal test and then visits a website about paternity testing. Paternity testing where the mother and father don't know. That was done at 11.51 p.m. and 11.52 p.m. on March the 30th. And then at 12.08, or 12.06, excuse me, a.m. on March 31st, some 14 minutes later, he sends a message to his mother. F this world. By the time you read this, I'll be six feet under. And then on April, or excuse, on April the 3rd, He's visiting websites about airplane tickets, Greyhound bus tickets, rental car, some of that being in Wichita, Kansas, which is where Thomas Richards lives, where his wife was planning to go with Alex on a trip. And then on 4-3, Mr. Daniel's wife texts him and says, Where are you? And he says... Mental health. And it's important to note, if you recall from the testimony, at this point, Big Joe and Bell were gone on the truck. They weren't home. The seed was planted that Crystal needed Joe Clyde, needed Joe Clyde's money, to be able to leave the defendant. I let him out, I shut the door, I moved the coffee table. The defendant let Joe Clyde out. He put him out. He closed the door. He moved the coffee table. He went out and caught Joe Clyde down by the road and took him back up to the house. Premeditation, ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you, was formed, began to be formed when he found those messages, and it was formed on that trip back up to the house. Because what happened when they got back to the house? The defendant killed Joe Clyde. Alex walks out, sees the defendant standing over Joe Clyde's lifeless body. Felony murder. That the defendant unlawfully killed the victim, Joe Clyde, and that the f killing was committed in the perpetration or the attempt to perpetrate aggravated child abuse and the defendant intended to commit the aggravated child abuse. How'd you beat him? I threw him on the floor. I spanked him countless times. I threw him on the coffee table. Might that have made a thump that woke up young Alex? So you never tell her exactly what happened to you? No. Why not? Because <laughs> no, I was afraid. I didn't have help. I need help. I've been to the hospital several times for something like this. Not for this long. Not for this. Oh, not for this. Why did I kill myself? 
before we go any further, I want to make a note here. Did you hear that last statement? Why did I kill my son? Think about the other statements that you've heard the defendant say. That boy. The boy. But here, as the truth is coming out, it's why did I kill my son? He says he never told Crystal exactly what happened because he was afraid someone would find out. Aggravated child abuse requires the defendant knowingly, other than by accidental means, treat a child in such a manner as to inflict injury. We know that happened because Joe Clyde was killed. The act of abuse resulted in serious bodily injury. That the child was eight years of age or less or vulnerable because the child was mentally defective. You have heard the testimony Joe Clyde was five years old when he was killed. You've also heard the testimony about Joe Clyde being developmentally delayed. Joe Clyde was slower than some of his peers, but he was making progress until the night of April the 3rd of 2018. You heard asked Alex testify as to what he saw that night. You heard the defendant's consistent confessions to killing his son. You heard from the statement between Noah and Aunt Joyce, Joe dead, Joe dead, Joe dead was Noah's statement. Aunt Joyce's reply, yes, baby, Joe dead. And ladies and gentlemen, that's why we're here. When you go back to deliberate, we're going to ask you to return a verdict of guilty because the night of April the 3rd, 2018, that man killed his son on a cold, dark, stormy night and hid his body. Don't reward him for concealing the body. He killed his son. We ask that you would find him guilty of it.